I am really pleased to introduce the next panel in this room. This panel that's happening now is James Haitian Revolution Plays. And I've got the difficult task of uh, managing four speakers on this panel before lunch, so I'm going to ask them all to keep to good time if that's possible. The first speaker that we have um, for you now is Christian Hogsberg, um, who is at the University of York. He has several editions, uh, one just appearing now uh, this year and uh, several forthcoming as well. He, uh, his book that is appearing now is uh, going to be launched tomorrow lunchtime uh, at the Blue Coats, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, and his paper now is called The Artist Must Like to Fight for Freedom, Paul Robeson and the Haitian Revolution. Thank you. Thanks to um, Rachel and um, every, everyone for coming, really. And, and oh, yeah, it's fantastic to have such a sort of panel and be on such a panel talking about James, James's plays. On the 24th of June 1937, London's Albert Hall, the mass rally in support of vast children made refugees during the Spanish Civil War. Paul Robeson eloquently warned of the danger of a rising tide of fascism across Europe. Every artist, every scientist, every writer must decide now where he stands. He has no alternative. There is no standing above a conflict on Olympian heights. There are no impartial observers. Through the destruction in certain countries of the greatest of man's literary heritages, through the propagation of false ideas of racial and national superiority, the artist, the scientist, the writer is challenged. The battlefront is everywhere. There is no sheltered rear. The artist must take sides. He must elect to fight for freedom or for slavery. I have made my choice. I had no alternative. The history of the capitalist era is characterized by the degradation of my people, despoiled of their lands, their culture destroyed. They are in every country, save one, denied equal protection of the law and deprived of their rightful place in respect of their fellows. Another Paul, Paul Gardulo, has noted, Robeson's references to a slave past and a slave present here are more than merely personal, poetic, or politic. They must be seen as a response to and an intervention in a broader and deeper cultural struggle regarding the role and representation of slavery when defining and depicting American and Atlantic culture, history, and its usual past between the two world wars. Paul Robeson was the son of William Drew Robeson, who in 1860, before the American Civil War had begun, aged only 15, managed to escape on the Underground Railroad from a plantation in North Carolina. And there are many, many moments in the interwar period where Paul Robeson intervenes in representations of, of slavery um, in this period. So just if we think just about him in Britain, in the early 1920s, his debut on the British stage came in, um, came in a melodrama called Voodoo um, by the white socialite uh, Mary Hoyt Weiberg, um, which is set in the antebellum South. Uh, in one brief moment, he's, he's transformed into a kind of voodoo chief. Really, in 1929, when Robeson made his British breakthrough, really, um, in Showboat, as Joe famously singing Old Man River, his haunting song of lament. As the English actress and theatre critic Mary Seaton remembered, Robeson sang about the flowing Mississippi and the pain of a black man whose life is like the eternal river rolling towards the open vastness of the ocean. The pathos of Robeson's voice called up images of slaves and overseers with whips. Robeson in the later 30s transformed Old Man River into a song more of resistance um, in, in the face of fascism. Um, another representation of Song of Freedom, um, 1956 film, um, which had an explicit, if very brief, sequence about the slave trade in the horrors of the Middle Passage. Um, and Robeson was actually allowed a degree of control over how the film turned out. Um, there's a clip, you can watch it, on, watch it on YouTube if you can't, if you can't get hold of it easily. But um, Hannah Durkin, in a recent article in Slavery and Abolition <coughs> Journal, she notes that some of freedom visually confronts historical realities of black oppression and does so in a manner which forces viewers to recognize slavery as a cycle of violence and exploitation and represents a unique instance in British cinema in which a black performer was able to reframe dehumanizing representations of historic black experiences into a hopeful vision of an independent black future. Um, although the film's perhaps not, you know, it is problematic in some senses in how it um, represents black people. Ultimately, R R Robeson himself felt uh, this was the first time he'd been allowed to play a real part in, in, in a film. You know, when it comes to usable pasts in the history of slavery for Robeson, really the outstanding example is the, what we're talking about, the thing of uh, this week, weekend's conference, really, the struggle for freedom uh, in, in, in the Haitian Revolution, the most epic, sort of most dramatic struggle in the whole history of resistance to, 
resistance to slavery. And um, the topic of Paul Robeson and Haitian Revolution is something I can't really, you know, it's a massive topic and it would need a lot more archival research um, than I'm really uh, capable to do here. But I just want to give a kind of just a sense of it and, and uh, a space where people can talk about, talk about this. It took you know, new resonance, really, the representation of the Haitian Revolution for, for Robeson in the interwar period, um, at the time when Haiti was under military occupation from the US. And also, as, as Robert mentioned in his, his opening lecture, uh, the issue of Abyssinia, Ethiopia, and, and the war in, in Ethiopia, um, 1935 by Mussolini's barbaric war. The first time Robeson, first encounter with the Haitian Revolution, Robeson, famously, as he recalls in Here I Stand, um, 1958, sort of autobiographical work, where he describes age 17 um, in April 1915. He gives an impassioned oration um, of the revolutionary American abolitionist Wendell Phillips's um, speech on Toussaint uh, Louverture. Um, he gives this in a, an oratorical contest at Rutgers College, um, where he just won a scholarship. That's him in age about 19, so two years later at Rutgers. Robeson paid tribute to, to Phillips in Here I Stand. He said he was the best kind of American, a fighter for black liberation, a white comrade of the great Frederick Douglass, speaker in countless towns on a literary subject $100 if on slavery free. Right. And he notes that Phillips would later go on support for the cause of um, the labor movement. Phillips put it, when I want to find the vanguard of a people, I look to the uneasy dreams of an aristocracy and find what they dread most. Um, <coughs> Phillips' eulogy of the Great Haitian Revolution in Toussaint uh, was made in New York and Boston during the first year of the American Civil War. And the, um, uh, Matthew Clavin has pointed out, really, the memory of the Haitian Revolution in the American Civil War was, um, was, 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 was critical one, inspirational the, um, to many abolitionists, both black and white. The company nickname of the famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment, one of the first official units of African Americans, which Phillips supported, um, and about a quarter of whom had been formerly enslaved was known as the company nickname of it was the Toussaint Guards. At the time, at the time, Robeson knew little of Phillips, really, or, or Toussaint, and it was not on any kind of school curriculum. Um, he says it was his brother Bill, um, who was about quite older, and was, was kind of this intellectual, real intellectual influence on the young Paul Robeson, who, who, who perhaps directed him towards this speech, giving a speech. And now, and both Paul Robeson recalled in hindsight, he said, now I marvel at the selection, for I had no real appreciation of its meaning, nor did I have any idea of the significance of a black person reciting it to an audience that was mostly white. But there I was, voicing with all the fervor and forensic skill I could muster, Wendell Phillips' searing attack on the concept of white supremacy. Um, and he quotes, Phillips quoted um, Toussaint's speech when um, Napoleon's brother-in-law, General Leclerc, sends his invasion force to kind of recolonize and try and reimpose slavery in Saint-Domingue. And Toussaint said, my children, France comes to make us slaves. God gave us liberty. France has no right to take it away. Burn the cities, destroy the harvests, tear up the roads with cannon, poison the wells, show the white man the hell he comes to make. It's a real shame, I think, Paul Robeson never really kind of recorded this speech later in his life, really, because it's a wonderful, yeah, it's a wonderful relation with climax. Builds up this soaring climax when, um, when, uh, when, when Phillips paid tribute to the martyr Toussaint Louis Mature. Um, the soldier, the statesman, the martyr, who, who stood out in the clear, in the sunlight, in the clear blue above, all the other sort of heroic sort of figures of sort of um, ancient Greece, ancient Rome, English and, and, and French and American sort of civilization. And the speech, Paul Robeson's uh, uh, speech in 1915, produced his father, um, yeah, former slave, as I mentioned, to, to, to tears, although Paul Robeson only came third in the contest. Another key moment was Paul Robeson as the Emperor Jones, uh, as Brutus Jones, Captain Brutus Jones. Um, it's one of the uh, earliest stage productions Robeson be involved with, first in America and then in 1925 in Britain, in Eugene O'Neill's play. In about a black American who ends up more by accident than design, ruling over a kind of an un unnamed kind of Caribbean island. It has all these echoes of, of, of Haiti, and at a time when um, Haiti was under occupation, which happened just after Robeson gave uh, that initial speech, um, it had real kind of symbolic resonances. Um, it was also, I mean, this was the first time uh, a black actor played a central role in a serious drama on the British stage was, was, was Robeson's portrayal of, of, of Brutus Jones. 1925, and though there's, um, yeah, there's, there's problems with, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a char character, I guess, there's uh, uh, remnants of kind of perhaps primitivism and so on, and um, that's just one example, I think, of how Robeson steadily got a bit more, got steadily frustrated with the roles he could get 
um, both on, 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 uh, in terms of representations of, of a black experience. And I think, I think clearly by 1926, there's this, um, again, this would be unpacked a bit more detail exactly why he says this, but in 1926, Robeson perhaps echoes this frustration when he says that he dreams, he dreamt, he told a reporter, Wilmington, Wilmington Evening News, he dreamt of a great play about Haiti, a play about Negroes, written by a Negro, acted by Negroes, of a moving drama that will have none of the themes but offer targets for race supremacy advocates. Um, another person dreaming about, about the Haitian Revolution from the 20s onwards was um, Sergei Eisenstein, great Soviet film director, um, who had become fascinated by the Haitian history after he purchased a copy of Black Majesty uh, by John um, van der Kirk, um, a novel about, about, about uh, Christoph, um, a white American, um, John van der Kirk. Um, he'd written this novel in 1928, and, and Eisenstein, while he was over in, in Hollywood working for Paramount, picked up a copy of this um, and, 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 and started talking about perhaps filming this with Robeson in the title role. Um, he began, yeah, he, he sort of also, yeah, began sort of making sketches of what Black Majesty might look like. Um, he really, I think Eisenstein had some appreciation of who Paul Robeson was, wanted to make a film uh, for Robeson, but would actually do justice, uh, finally do justice to him. But, however, uh, you know, Robeson, uh, the problem was Paramount, a big Hollywood corporation, it was never really likely to happen. Paul Robeson, his quote from Paul Robeson, he said, I, I find I cannot portray the life nor express the living hopes and aspirations of the struggling people from which I come. One man cannot face the film companies. They represent about the biggest aggregate of finance capital in the world. And they knew that this was never really going to be a runner, this film. As Eisenstein would later tell his Russian film students, when I was in America, I wanted to make a film of this rising of Haiti, but it was impossible. Nowadays, Haiti is virtually a colony of the United States. So that didn't help. He returned in 1932, Eisenstein II, back to the Soviet Union, and now wanted to um, try and make a film under a Soviet no novelist had made, um, and Natoli Vinogradov's The Black Consul. The Soviet film industry at the time is really interesting. It's an interesting moment. Uh, Eisenstein's under increasing pressure, under bureaucratic um, controls and things, and, but there is yet still at this time, there's this idea that the Soviet film industry might make a great film about, about about uh, a great anti-racist film. There's people like Langston Hughes is over in the Soviet Union at this time um, as part of a black and white film project. Although this, this project, in fact, doesn't come to pass. Um, it's supposed to be a film about, uh, I think, workers in um, an American factory, black and white uniting. The problem was, is there's a, a film highlighting a successful slave rebellion might, have sh might not have shown blacks as, as having too much liberty might have shown blacks having too much liberty and being able to overthrow their oppressors by themselves, and it might have challenged some of the paternalistic sense that, that, Soviet, that the, the Soviet Union would have wanted to portray a film, the fact that they, you know, the importance of the Russian Revolution, the importance of the Soviet Union, actually, um, in, in all this story. However, Eisenstein now is able to meet, thanks to Albert Marie Seaton, I mentioned earlier, he's able to finally bring Paul Robeson over, invite him over in 1934, late 1934, um, Herbert Marshall in the middle, who was um, a student of Eisenstein's. The two meeting every fantastic, fantastic few days over in late 1924. Seaton describes their intense discussions. After knowing Robeson for 24 hours, Eisenstein, who was a skeptical critic of great men, attributed human genius to Robeson because he was without falseness. Six days later, Robeson, who had met many of the greatest artists and thinkers of the 20th century, said that meeting Eisenstein was one of the greatest experiences of his life, and they had hopes that they might make this film, might make them a black console. Um, there, these, um, they'd hoped, this is um, Solomon Michels, who was actually, they thought Robeson was too big physically to play Toussaint, who was, you know, kind of quite small. So the idea was Solomon Michels, a uh, Jewish uh, actor, was, good, was perhaps going to black up and play Toussaint. Mm. Um, that's their meeting in, I think, 1943 during the Second World War. Eisenstein was under, under pressure now, increasing pressure from, 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 from the Soviet authorities. And when he, in 19, early 1935, he explained to uh, the All Union Creative Conference of Soviet Film Workers, this is after Robeson had returned, returned left, left Russia, he said, we'd hoped to produce the film the best episodes of the Haitian Revolution, what was to have been the Black Consul, which was at the outset based less on the figure of Toussaint Louverture than on the character of another revolutionary general who went on to govern the Republic of Haiti. His story developed like a Shakespearean tragedy. 
However, there followed a breach between him and the Haitian revolutionary masses, and the death of the erstwhile leader, caused by his increasing remoteness from the revolutionary masses. This role was created through a remarkable actor, Paul Robeson, who welcomed here as our guest not so long ago. And I think such a shift away in Eisenstein's thinking from the revolutionary black consul of Toussaint to portraying Christophe, one of the Christophe, uh, uh, um, the black majesty of, of King Christophe and his increasing remoteness of the revolutionary masses was, I think, a sense in which Eisenstein perhaps was trying to allude to the degeneration of revolution. What happens when a revolution goes down and it perhaps is an implicit critique of the Soviet bureaucracy at the time. In any case, this was not the sort of film the Soviet authorities were ever going to make, especially in the aftermath of the Kirov, Sergei Kirov's assassination. Meanwhile, Bobson, who's now filming Showboat, who is about to start work on Showboat, he succeeds in interesting um, Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II, and, and James Well, film director of, 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 of Showboat, in the possibilities back of Van der Kook's, Van der Kook, Kook, Kook's Black Majesty project. On the 12th of January 1936, Robeson told an interviewer the New York Herald Tribune, the most interesting thing I can see ahead for the next season is the musical play that Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II may do, based on Black Majesty, the story of Emperor Henri Christophe, who built his great citadel in Haiti and defeated Napoleon's troops. It sounds like great material, doesn't it? James Wells had hopes of an interesting Alexander um, Korda, um, Hungarian film director, to actually direct this film, but um, by now, Robeson had had a disillusioning moment with Corda over Sanders of the River, and, um, and this has been a very painful experience, actually, um, for Robeson um, in general, as the film turned out glorif to glorify the British Empire, contrary to what it thought, which was supposed to be portraying the majesty of African civilization. And um, now Robeson uh, turned down the offer, actually, of appearing in King Kostov in Black Majesty, he was highly sceptical about the project. He said, could you imagine a black king being treated seriously in Hollywood? Um, so it's interesting, both May 36 you, um, is the time when the, the Soviet project, the Black Consul, runs into difficulties and is cancelled. That's the same month that uh, the, this, the, the ideas of Black Majesty um, in, in Hollywood come out. So both, you know, for all their differences, you know, America, the Hollywood setup and the new civilization of Soviet Russia, both of them, neither of them want to make this film about the Haitian Revolution. That's something we can talk about in the in discussion, maybe perhaps why there's no, been no great film about the Haitian Revolution ever made. It was, it was Robeson, he said in 1959, he said one of his greatest regrets in life was not being able to act the part of Toussaint Louverture in a film. Why, why, why this is really interesting topic to consider is, is a letter, that October 1937, that Islander Robeson wrote to an aspiring writer. Um, she said that both herself and her husband Paul continued to read about the Haitian Revolution. <coughs> and had read 50 books and some hundred plays and scenarios about Christophe, Dessalines, and Toussaint. So even if she's exaggerating, what are these books that Robeson's reading? What are these play scripts and things that he's being offered? You know, it shows really the, the fact that there is the material being offered to Robeson about the Haitian Revolution in this time, which is, in itself, we hasn't really been fully, fully looked at and needs need a lot more archival research, I think. And Herbert Marshall, who I showed earlier, um, in his archives, there's a... Uh, there's two manuscripts. There's um, a manuscript by a Scottish playwright, James Forsyth, Defiant Island, or Citadel Henry, Henry about the life of Henri Christophe, which was actually performed in BBC Radio as, as Christophe in 1958. It was later published in the 1970s, but it remains obscure and overlooked. Uh, another play, is even more, another script is even more obscure. It's called The Black Prophet by Rufus E. Fennell, who would Black West Indian who would star in uh, would star as McCoy in, in, in one of the performances of, of, of James's Two Sun Leverture. Um, and would later star alongside Robeson in Jericho. And he writes this script set in early 20th century Haiti for Robeson as a vehicle. It's never never yet yeah, never published or, or, or performed. However, it's kind of yeah, as Landis says that all these plays and scenarios around Haiti all have been strangely disappointing, save one, which we actually did produce here in London at a special experimental theatre. We feel the history and the characters are too good to spoil in a poor play. We're continuing to read manuscripts. And the one, the one that did not prove strangely disappointing, which was performed at Westminster Theatre in London in March 1936 by the stage side, was, was Toussaint Louverture by C.L.R. James. And I think it's testimony to the quality of James' James's understanding of Asian Revolution and what they meant to Robeson. When, when he was presented with James's script, he said, yes, this is the one we will perform. Yeah, he was apparently considering four other scripts at the time. Um, at uh, that particular time. He, according to James, Robeson read it and with great simplicity and directness said yes, he would be ready to play the role. 
And Robeson, when he had this chance to play the Toussaint, his one chance he starred in a play written by a writer of African descent, he, he, he took it and stole the show as the reviews of the production show. It was James moment in November 1983, the moment he came on stage, the whole damn thing changed. It was not a question of acting. The physique and the voice, the spirit behind him, you could see it when he was on stage. Robeson was really important for C.L.R. James as well um, when he came to write, writing the Black Jack, and imagining the Black Jack events. Not only was Robert Hills pointed out because of the sort of the physical presence of, of, of Robeson's great sort of gentle, gentle giant, those, um, uh, you know, sort of represented immense power and great gentleness, and, and what that what that symbolised for, for James. But also, I think because the, the parallels between Paul Robeson and Toussaint are quite interesting. I can't really explore them here. We heard about just how for Toussaint, the French Revolution was so important, or at least that's how James portrayed it. For Robeson, it was the Russian Revolution, really, this chance of a new society, the Soviet Union. And just as, just as Toussaint sent his two sons to go and be educated in the Revolution in Paris in the 1790s, so Paul Robeson sent his son, Paul Robeson Jr., to the Soviet Union to be there. And James, in his, his, his article on Paul Robeson, Black Star, actually tries to allude to how just as the... I think just as for Toussaint, when the French Revolution goes down, degenerates into counter-revolution, Toussaint didn't have the independence, intellectual independence, to really break from that, and, and went, ultimately went down with it. It was a tragic hero. So I, I, I think, and this is again some controversial matter, but James sees Robeson, I think his, his tragedy, that just as the Russian Revolution degenerates down, Robeson doesn't have the intellectual independence, and that ultimately, for James, he argues, means that he's not the, great, the, the leader of the American Civil Rights Movement when it bursts in the 1950s, as was his right really, on some levels, because of who he was, because of the work he did uh, for black liberation in, himself. Not, not to, that's a controversial point I'm going to do justice to, but I think <coughs> Robeson was marginalised when he should have been, um, you know, he should have been, he should have been alongside King and, and the others. Robeson, however, keeps fighting. He's a relentless fighter against imperialism. He's learned the lessons of the Haitian Revolution well, and I think there's a in um, 1954, he denounces uh, he denounces the French in um, in Vietnam, in yeah, in, what, in Vietnam, and and he denounces the, the growing kind of American interest in Vietnam. He talks about Ho Chi Minh as the Tusan Louverture of Indochina, the modern day Tusan Louverture leading his people to freedom. There's a great passage. People can read it in Paul Burks and speaks exactly what he says. I just think how he ends that um, that discussion. He he quotes. By Charles G. Baylor, black attorney of Providence, Rhode Island, um, a, a point he'd made in the Black Weekly Richmond Planet in 1898. Um, and Baylor had said in 1898, the American Negro cannot become the ally of imperialism without enslaving his own race. And that was 1898. I think today in the age of Obama, of drone warfare abroad, with mass black imprisonment still key in America itself, I think there's lessons there, but I think about the Haitian Revolution, about Paul Robeson, about two Sunday the children that remain by it. Well, we're now going to continue to talk about Robeson uh, in the Czech Jeremy Book paper, uh, which uh, I will introduce a lot further ado. Um, same level. <laughs> C.R. James looks at St. John the Baptist preaching, bodily compression, and oceanic logic of ungendering in Robeson, Rock, and Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I should say before I start, you know, I've been affiliated with a small uh, radical organization in Newark, New Jersey, where uh, Mitty Baraka is at the helm. And I asked maybe 20 years ago, or 15 years ago, Baraka if I could interview him about CLR James for a small newspaper that came out of Rutgers. And his response immediately was, anything that I can do that will encourage people to read James, no problem. <laughs> um, so it, it's interesting, I actually lived down the street from the Robeson House, one of them in New Brunswick. So I'm going to talk today, uh, there's three epigrams. The subtitle of, is really called CLR James Looks at St. John the Baptist Preaching. So it starts with three epigrams. One is from Hortense Spillers. Those African persons without names that their captors would recognize were in movement across the Atlantic, but they were also nowhere at all. Inasmuch as and on any given day, we might imagine the captive personality did not know uh, where she or he was. We could say that they were culturally unmade, thrown in the midst of a figurative darkness that exposed their destinies to an unknown course. The second one is from the autobiography of Kwame Nkrumah. He writes, Mr. C.L.R. James, and through him, 
I learned how an underground movement worked. And the third is from Rilke, from the archaic toro, torso of Apollo, where Rilke Wil writes famously, you must change your life. Um, for Hortense Spillers, the antinomian logic of the Middle Passage houses liberatory potential for unraveling gendered pro logics. My book manuscript, from which these remarks are drawn, uses C.L.R. James and Bertolt Brecht as a framework to think about youth and masses and leaders in 20th century plays of the Haitian Revolution. I place Spiller's sense of unmaking alongside how such plays make the Haitian Revolution over and over again in a space of performance. For this morning's sake, sometimes the building blocks of what Cedric Robinson calls black radicalism's ontologic totality, the collective consciousness informed by the historical struggles for liberation, are made from stone and marble. In 1932, when James departed for his first trip to the United Kingdom, he was tasked to write a series of vignettes on British culture and society for the Port of Spain, Gazette, Trinidad. In London's Victoria and Albert Museum, he saw Rodin's sculpture, St. John the Baptist preaching. James writes, I sat and watched, and when the body is still, the mind moves. James concedes here to intellectual work, the radical force of motion, a somewhat separate, but still tethered to the still body. This encounter provokes <coughs> questions of temporality, embodiment, and identification that for James would sustain decades of revolutionary political praxis. Rodin's sculpture is larger than life. This flies in the face of the usual compression fate of other Rodin sculptures. Art historian John Berger writes of the, quote, compression Rodin's figures suffer, end quote. Rodin's technique of bodily compression and hyperextension, analyzed in the writings of his assistant, Rainer Maria Rilke, both in his study, Auguste Rodin, and in his novel, resonates with C.L.R. James' reflections on his lead actor, Paul Robeson, who for James is an embodied synecdoche of black revolutionary aspiration. In the manuscript, I spent about 100 pages talking about their friendship, so this is just one little part. In this larger-than-life figure of Robeson, a whole philosophical and aesthetic register of black radicalism is compressed. The work of Hazel Carby can be read as a conceptual bridge for me, licking this question of scale in Rodin to the 1925 series of Robeson photographs, along with Professor Hill's reflection on the importance of Robeson's masculinity for James. Nicholas Murray's photographic images of Robeson in Carby's analysis attempt to capture a naked Robeson in a variety of cramped, compressed spaces. James' early perception of St. John the Baptist introduces the problem of arranging bodies on stage and staging the interdependence between individual and mass bodies imperative to the problem of revolutionary leadership in Haiti. The figurative violence done to bodies in Rodin sculptures, the violence of compression and hyperextension, is a thought catalyst, perhaps, for a young Trinidadian intellectual who charts his own radical political roadmap by dramatically staging the philosophical calculus of acts of violence against and on behalf of bodies during the Haitian Revolution. A seed is planted, perhaps, for James that dialectically links sculpture of compression, the force of reduction, with the multiplication of uses in the Haitian Revolution, the force of proliferation. A long 19th century explosion of freedom in the French colony of San Domingo both distills and sharpens the imprint, the Rodin sculpture made on James, who translates its affect into a play. Part two I call Naked Declivity versus Nude. Rodin's Saint, Saint Jean Prechamp, 1878, defies mimetic representation by design. It is fashioned larger than life in response to critics who accuse Rodin of using cast, body casts, of his sculpture, The Age of Bronze. Corporal aggrandizement in St. James makes legible the sculptural representation of mental gears turning. Compressed in its sculpture largesse is a whole theory of thought in motion. Rodin explained to his friend, Paul Gazelle, that the paradoxical still movement in his figure steps signifies attitudinal flux. He writes, note, 
First, the movement is the transition from one attitude to another. And it is, in short, a metamorphosis of this kind that the painter or the sculpture affects in giving movement to his personages. <coughs> he represents the tr transition from one pose to another. He indicates how insensibly the first glides into the second. In his work, we, sh we still see a part of what, and, and we discover of a part of what is to be. Um, the quick transitions, in other words, the glides, are a result of rehearsal and constant preparation. The fragment I'm presenting to you today is from my manuscript chapter discussion of how mediation functions in C.L.R. James Haiti work, both the history and the play. When James visited the Victoria and Albert Museum's Rodin uh, exhibit, the sculptures were likely curated by captions drawn from the writings of Rilke. In his 1903 to 1907 study of Rodin, Rilke offers, thank you, a way to think about dramatization of revolutionary past that thematically intersect with the endeavors of the plays I analyzed in this larger study. Rilke's musings are surprising, surprisingly Deleuzean in its language of becoming and emphasis on the proliferation of use. He writes, this simple becoming concrete of its longings or its apprehensions, an artistic whole must not necessarily be identical with the usual thing whole, the independent of it, there arises within the picture itself new unities, new associations, new relationships, and new adjustments. Longings here recalls how, how far desire propels artists intellectuals mining Haitian revolutionary past for their use. An example, James's activist ensemble's need to help shape an armed struggle decolonization agenda for Africa. Indeed, complex stagings and restagings of the Haitian Revolution produce, quote, new unities, new associations, relationships, and adjustments. Yet, there's a challenge to use insight from sculpture, a fairly permanent and stable aesthetic form, to illuminate a work of drama in its fleeting performative register, a challenge in need of a mediating concern for the specificity of these different art forms. This uh, resonates for me with um, the back and forth that Professor Hill was speaking about this morning. Uh, Ro Rilke writes, Rodin has always shown the power of lifting the past into the realm of the permanent when historical characters or facts seem to live again through his art, end quote. The arrangement of bodies on stage helped bridge the gap between the ephemeral and the permanent, constituting the relationship between performance and sculptural arts. The gap or the lacuna also holds true for Haitian revolutionary plays, negotiation of past and presence, a performance, a permanence of reference, a historical reserve. The Haitian revolution is reaccessed. Its fleeting nature as performance is defied. Each time an artist stage, stages its historical becoming. Here is what Rilke had to say about the sculpture that caught James's attention that day. Rilke writes, one might describe this moment movement, rather, by saying that it rests enclosed in a tight bud. Let thought be set on fire, let the will be swept by tempest, and it will open. And we have that John with the eloquent, agitated arms, with the great stride of one who feels another coming after him. The man's body is not untested. The fires of the desert have scorched him. Hunger has wrapped him. The thirst of every kind has tried him. He has come through all and is hardened. The lean, aesthetic body is like a wooden handle in which is set the wide fork of his stride. He advances, advances as though all the wide spaces of the world were within him, as if he were apportioning them with his speed, seeming to make the sign of striding forward in the air. This John is the first pedestrian figure in Rodin's work. And this is what James says about the very same. James writes, John the Baptist, Rodin called it, but it's no more John the Baptist than I am John the Baptist. It's a statue of a naked man walking. That's all, neither more nor less. And Rodin was persuaded to call it John the Baptist. But all that is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is the statue. In the basement of the British Museum are plaster casts, casts of the Apollo Belvedere and the Venus de Milo. But on the Day of Judgment, the 20th century will be able to look at the old Greeks in the eye and say, quote, 
we admit that yours are the best, but, and then produce Rodin. <laughs> no one who sees it can pass it by. That is one thing with the plastic arts. You need some training in literature and more in music, but any fool who will take the trouble to look can see a picture of a, sta or of a statue. I was dreadfully tired, I, I dreadfully tired out, but the thing made me feel fresh again. Ours is not the only age of scientific enterprise and multitudinous organization. Browning was speaking of a girl, but there are other things than girls that make the blood burn. The Rodin statue is one. I sat and watched it, and when the body is still, the mind moves. I reflected that a Greek who lived 2,000 years ago could have sat with me and watched. He would have seen it with much the same eyes and feelings that I did. But the Schneider plane would have been meaningless to him. 3,000 years from now, some wanderer from the West Indies will walk down Exhibition Road. He will go into the Science Museum and see the latest thought plane. That vanished type of conveyance aircraft will be represented by models. Will he see Lieutenant Stanforth's plane? Only as one of the crowd of obsolete designs. But in the art museum, he will see the statue of the man walking. It will be for him as it is to me. It cannot grow old. It cannot go out of date. It is timeless, made materially of bronze, but actually has been said of great literature, the precious lifeblood of a master spirit. This is why, though I shall sometimes visit the Museum of Sciences, it will always be on my way to the Museum of Art. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. So, in what I just read, C.L.R. James evacuates Rodin's Jean of all its particularity. The joke is on us for James. It is no more John the Baptist than I am John the Baptist. Such evacuation happens on the level of proper name. The sculpture represents an almost transhistorical representation of man on the move a representation that, by way of its formal qualities, is accessible to all. No training needed, no admonishment about flubbing your Shakespearean intonations and rhythms. I'm referring here to a letter James wrote uh, to Constant Webb, where he chastises Robeson for his line delivery in Othello. Its accessibility, its universality, trumps discourses of technological progress. It defies formulas that equate tech savvy with supremacy. Much like Malcolm X's famous quote, you know, when the lights go out, it's even Stephen. Um, the Schneider plane is meaningless to the 2,000-year-old Greek, but the Rodin makes the blood burn. Rilke's exposition links earthly suffering with the formal detail of the finished product. Tests by fire and hunger are legible on the figure's body itself. The chisel writes on the figural body an archive of world historical suffering. Such suffering is implotted in bronze. John is more runaway maroon, but also Walter Benjamin's flaneur. The figure's stride anticipates the chase, anticipates the flight from those in pursuit. The first pedestrian figure in Rodin's work registers a litany of earthly sufferings, tragic sufferings, if you, if you will. And that litany, that litany is captured, heightened, and reflected by the formal mastery and care of the sculpture artist. The earthly suffering in this formulation mandates formless attention. For my work, this resonates with Hazel Carby on aforementioned photographs of Paul Robeson. She writes, though the body is in repose, the tense muscles, the enlarged veins of the right arm and hand, and the light playing on the heels and curled toes indicate that at any moment, this man, Robeson, could spring into action and become a force that could not be contained, end quote. John's stillness of body for James signifies movement of mind. This is a helpful reminder when considering how modernist representation of Paul Robeson, analyzed by Carby, want to lock his subject's meaning in a bodily frame. Yet the body and the mind escape. Coupling John Berger's gendered opposition between naked and nude with Mark, Marksman's translation of Fanon's formulation, naked declivity, helps to finalize this point. OK, I'm going to try to do this really quick. Um, consider some lines from Franz Fanon's uh, Black Skin, White Masks. He says, there is a zone of non-being, an extraordinary, thanks, sterile, a an arid region, an utterly naked declivity where an authentic upheaval can be born. In most cases, the black man lacks the advantage of being able to accomplish this ascent into real hell. 
Okay, in this Fanon formulation, un ramp, a ramp, slope or incline, essential, my French pronunciations are terrible, but basically the formulation un ramp, essentiellement, and de poulet, uh, meaning bare synthesis, translates by Markman into naked declivity. It's unclear that the descent is unwanted, as much as it is unclear the nature of the impediments blocking the plunge into such a fiery descent. One might assume that the morbid conditions Fanon analyzes in the pages that follow account for such a lack. The descent is desirable, since that is where an authentic upheaval can be born. Surely there is more in black skin white mass that require upheaving. Here, naked is the precondition of upheaval, nakedness as a precondition for revolution. Nakedness also might be the precondition for escaping the overdetermined modernist <coughs> racial calculus that confuses photographically capturing Robeson's body with actually capturing his body. And John Berger, I'm going to skip this part, he does, makes this opposition between naked and nude, naked being for oneself, nude being one, for one other. Um, Hazel Carby writes in Captain Cipriani, as well as in his cricket journalism, C.L.R. James sought to develop a theory of direct, unmediated, unmediated relation between the heroic male figure of the people, a theory which used the cultural aesthetics of body lines in direct opposition to the modernist strategies of cultural producers like Murray or McPherson, who regarded themselves as necessary mediators and interpreters of art. Thinking alongside and against this assertion of desire for an unmediated relation, um, I'm interested in posing the problem of mediation and revolutionary leadership as a central question that animates James's Haiti work. I'll conclude with a consideration of two sentence formulations that deal with this problem of mediation. The first from Carvey, where she writes, the Negro as a creation of the modernist aesthetic could never become a political comrade, semicolon. And when Robeson himself determined to embody an alliance between art and activism for social change, his body was forever severed from the modernist aesthetic, end quote. And then the second is uh, one of Brecht's last poems, and I always thought, and I always thought, colon, the very simplest words must be enough. When I say what things are like, everyone's heart must be torn to shreds, that you'll go down if you don't stand up for yourself. Surely you see that. This juxtaposition illuminates a different work done by punctuation marks. In the Carby formulation, the semicolon, and in the Brecht poem, the colon. For Brecht, the colon functions as a kind of punctuational alienation effect. It casts a hue of suspicion on all words that follow. In other words, it suggests that you might want to reevaluate what you always thought. The very simplest words mediate understanding of a world, whereas such mediational understanding is a precondition for changing it. In his last poetic offering, Breck radically undermines a large part of his entire life's work, part because at least his song cycles and dramatic texts contain an element of performance and excess of the merely, te of the merely textual. Breck, the poet, who employs simple words to achieve a de desired revolutionary affect in a moment of acute self-criticism punctu punctuates the rationale of his life praxis. Breck, the poet, to riff from a line from Edouard Glissant's Monsieur Toussaint, quote, goes up into the woods for the sake of the general liberty. What does it mean, as Carby writes, to quote, never to become a political comrade? The left side of the semicolon in Carby has a binding function the right side, the liberatory becomings of escape that then reinscribe part of the left side, stretching the bo boxing adage politically, don't drop your, drop your left. The static, atavistic, representational, vexed product of the modernist imagination, the so-called Negro, does not, in the bound properties of its status as mo modernist fantasy, have what it takes to become a political comrade, to craft a space of becoming through revolution. The modernist representation of the real person, Robeson, who was political comrade to multiple political bases and multiple mass constituencies in Carby's formulation has less possibility than the inspired remainder from Rilke's uh, cricket torso of Apollo's mandate, you must change your life, or at least initially seems so. In the first half of Carby's sentence, the Negro doesn't exist outside the modernist representational fashioning. He is strictly a product of this representational calculus, and as such, cannot make the jump to a space of political comradeship that is a space of revolutionary flux and contingency. Yet, Robeson escapes again and again, severing himself from the modernist aesthetic, 
Robeson re-enters a space of radical possibility, re-enters because he is always there despite the ossification efforts of his enemies. Carby continues to insist on the imperative to think the level of bodies. Robeson's body severed reintroduces possibility and radical becomings. The semicolon in Carby's sentence denotes negation and dialectical reinscription, severing Robeson's body to claim his body as a space of always already radical possibility. Thank you. It's a real great pleasure now to, re to welcome Rachel Douglas back to Liverpool, uh, now at the University of Glasgow. Rachel's uh, current work is on the CLR James and rewriting of the Haitian Revolution, hence the inspiration for this great <laughs> conference. Um, her paper today is Making Drama of the Haitian Revolution from Below, CLR James as the Black Jacobins, 1967 play. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to try and make this very short because I have to lead by example. So. Um, <laughs> In this paper, I look at how James's. I, I'm looking at the 19 at the second play, the Black Jacobins play, first performed in 1967 in Nigeria, and I'm thinking about how turning to drama again in the second play enables James to tell a different story about the Haitian Revolution and to change the protagonists by shifting the spotlight somewhat downwards. And this paper explores how changes to protagonists present a version of the Haitian Revolution seen more from below. And the play will be analysed particularly from the viewpoint of its demythologization of revolutionary leaders Toussaint, Dessalines Chris and Christophe. And simultaneously bringing into view of crowds, peasants, ordinary soldiers and popular alternative leaders. So the first section is on um, Haitian revolutionary crowds. And what emerges clearly in James's attempt to represent the unrepresented by bringing crowds of ordinary soldiers more sharply into view. So that's what emerges. And crowds are written in by stage directions, which portray these slaves as alternative collective protagonists bearing heroic characteristics. And so this is the quotation, crowds say little, but their presence is felt powerfully at all critical moments. This is the key moment of the, this is the key point of the play and comments cannot, must not be written. It must be felt dramatically and be projected as essential to action in downstage areas. This is a bit problematic. Um, problematically, this crowd as protagonist still remains largely silent with limited and unscripted dramatic roles. And tellingly, while reworking representations of such rank and file characters, the playwright poses a revealing handwritten question in the margins, should they speak? And despite new emphasis, crowds still remain problematically rather silent, rather faceless. Um, but James does, however, take pioneering from below studies of European crowds by Albert Souboul, Georges Houdet, E.P. Thompson, and Eric Hobsbawm in new directions. Um, he takes them to, he widens the focus to Haitian revolutionary crowds and from French revolutionary sans culotte, bras nu, enragé, to the menu peuple. So that's the mass of ordinary black ex-slaves. And this crowd representing the great mass of slaves functions as a chorus operating as organizing tool for theater from below, as in the type of radical Marxist, theorist, uh, Marxist theater theorized by Augusto Boal, where crowds do not meekly toe the line nor speak dutifully in chorus, but instead function as dissenting um, voices that challenge and answer back. And crowd scenes are used increasingly towards the end to highlight fundamental divisions between official generals and the great mass of ex-slaves, showing that they're fighting for different political goals, um, with leaders actually fighting against the masses. And nowhere is this made clearer than in the scenes where particularly Dessalines, but also Toussaint and Christophe suppress ordinary revolutionaries. 
And this widespread repression meted out by revolutionary leaders against popular masses emerges where, when Dessalines barks orders that the singing of their own popular anthem to the attack, Grenadier, must be halted forthwith. And this anthem is used to contrast the masses' political goals and capacities with those of the main leaders. And it's a stark contrast, which is writ large, um, with when Dessalines contemptuously mocks the song of the rank and file revolutionaries, while Christophe professes not even to know it. Uh, so out of touch is he, this leader. And then at news of Toussaint's death, the popular protest becomes a more mournful chart, chant sorry, through which the crowd directs resentment at Dessalines. Hard-nosed in his own pursuit of power, Dessalines very forcibly drowns out the song and um, he orders his own music, a European minuet and dancing, to recommence as the crowd flees. And the next section's on Sandy Smith, Peasants, Brigands and Barefooted Men. And the song is called the Sandy Smith song throughout the play. And the revolutionary fighting protest anthem of the masses takes its name from an alternative popular leader, um, Sandy Smith, described as a black peasant and barefooted and in rags, but undoubtedly a man of authority. And he's singled out of the crowd as peasant leader of an insurrectionary band. <coughs> Sandy Smith represents one of the many thousands of obscure leaders um, organizing popular resistance about whom James says he would have liked or he would like to know more in that 1971 Institute of the Black World lecture that Bobby mentioned this morning tantalizingly entitled How I Would Rewrite the Black Jacobins. Sandy Smith is the only representative of these bands who actually ever speaks, but Dessalines and Toussaint note popular leaders are everywhere, and they single out Macaya, Silla, Sans Souci, Jean Panier, who represent a more popular leadership stratum, able to guide the people's own autonomous action simultaneously against um, French troops and against the forces of the Haitian generals. And throughout Sandy Smith's interventions, there's um, a lot of the first person plural pronoun we um, predominates to indicate a collective uh, function where exploits depend less on any single leader and more on a collection of heroes. And as more collective protagonists, the relationship of these men of the people is presented <coughs> as one of total solidarity with the pe peasantry as symbolized by the fact that this champion of barefooted men is himself a barefooted man. Um, and certainly, uh, James comes closest in the Black Jacobins play to doing what he said he would like to do in uh, the 1971 lecture, rewriting the history to give Toussaint Louverture only a walk on part, and instead foregrounding other popular, more obscure leaders instead. Now, of course, even in the, the second play, Toussaint's role remains a lot more important than that of a walk-on part. Um, but representational shifts have taken place with the top black Jacobin leadership of Toussaint, Dessalines, Christophe, now being challenged by alternative, popular alternative leaders, Sandy Smith, Jean Panier, Silla, Sans Souci, and the most important challenger of all, Moïse. Um, this is actually um, not the, the second play, this is the first play, but um, this is from the archives in Trinidad, um, and it's, it's one scene where, I mean, you can actually see of the 1936 play that, that James is writing in Moïse, uh, normally to replace uh, Dessalines, and particularly Christophe is just written out entirely of the scene. But there are also, for the second play's typescripts, there are also various states of genesis and some scenes where Moise is written in a bit more, etc. So um, writing out initial arch protagonist Toussaint Louverture during the making of the Black Jacobins play, James progressively writes in alternative hero of the masses, Moise. So here Moise takes center stage and his showdown with Toussaint forms the epicenter of the entire play. Moïse, 
had long been on James's mind, as revealed in this key letter from 1955 to Haitian historian Etienne Chalier. And he says, I notice that there's still very little precise to put one's hands upon in the history of Moïse. He is the man of the minor figures who interest me most. I hope one, that one day something will turn up. And he says something similar in the history too, where he says something like, what did Moïse stand for? We will never know. He says this in the letter and rewriting the Black Jacobins as a play specifically enables James to develop this minor figure of Moïse into main alternative protagonist. At the crux of the play is the showdown, what, what James christened, um, he christened the scene, the showdown with Moïse, where Moïse acts as defiant challenger to Toussaint, directly calling into question his alienating uh, leadership methods. So here prisoner Moïse has just been court-martialed, sentenced to death for treason, and accused of leading rebellions against Toussaint's rule. And upon entering the scene, stage directions indicate that Moïse's black eye patch should be immediately prominently visible, speaking to the true meaning of words like liberty, freedom, and independence. So these are causes for which he lost an eye, and then for which he will ultimately lose his entire life. Um, so presented here, Moïse is presented here as a political organiser with mass popular support, involved in active collective movement against big leaders, and Moïse acts as alternative to increasingly unpopular and isolated Toussaint. Advocating independence, Moïse makes it clear that this is what is needed. And Moïse acts as a foil to show up major flaws in pitiful old Toussaint's leadership style, especially uncommunicativeness about strategies and his continued allegiance to the French. So Moïse's sentencing to death forms the structural and thematic centre of the play, but even after death, his popular and principled alternative leadership style and ideas continue to loom large, with Dessalines underlining that the killing of Moïse was pivotal in Toussaint's own downfall. But now Moïse's ideas are flourishing in new soil through thousands of Samji Smiths. And right at the end, clear-sighted Moïse is invoked as the one who could have charted the path towards true independence. So what hope is there at the end of this final bleak scene? Answer, very little. Ideals of the Haitian Revolution are symbolised above all by Moïse, and Moïse is dead. Um, so this is my, moving on to my conclusion, which is about the epilogue, um, changing the ending, the epilogue. So in the unperformed and unpublished epilogue, however, Moïse isn't dead, um, but he's reincarnated instead um, as modern-day political organiser, Speaker D. And clearly bringing the play up to date, this epilogue rapidly fast-forwards in time from the Declaration of Haitian Independence, so right at the end, 1803, beginning of 1804, and um, up to the present day. So this is a time travel indicated visibly by costume changes to um, modern clothes. And costume changes also expose the hypocrisy of this independent situation. When actors doff the native dress, native dress of all previous scenes only to don Western clothes. And then against this new top leadership who compromise newly acquired independence with continuing, depend with continuing dependence on foreign capital and a rather bureaucratic top-down approach. Um, so against that stands archetypal revolutionary alternative Speaker D, a.k.a. Moïse. Um, so now that Haitian revolutionary Moïse has morphed into his 20th century political organiser equivalent, Speaker D concludes the epilogue by delivering a rousing speech to an audience off stage. And at the outset, suspense is created by positioning him three quarters turned away from the audience, from the real audience, with most of his face still hidden. 
And it's only when the speech ends that he half turns towards the audience and that's when his true identity as Moise is revealed um, and because now can be seen that symbol of uh, revolutionary struggle for independence, the black eye patch over the sacrificed eye. So turning to face the real audience, Moise also deliberately wipes his eye with a handkerchief and that's a gesture um, from earlier on in the play which recalls mopping blood from the lost eye and thereby all the sacrifices for real independence. A prime function of uh, the epilogue was to act as reconfiguration tool. And so it's essential to consider James's own reworking of this epilogue because it exists in at least three different versions. The earliest draft is from a specifically Caribbean vantage point and makes references to the West Indies, Caribbean politics, and especially to the failed West Indian Federation projects. Caribbean references are then removed from the two subsequent versions where the epilogue is rewritten to make it less localized. And in so doing, the epilogue loses some of its own situatedness and immediate context, particularly at the end of the second version of Speaker D's present day speech, which I don't like very much, but this is it. Fighting means taking risks. You have to learn to re risk your liberty, your property, even your life. But here, Speaker D's closing words are a bit vague and do appear slightly platitudinous on a par with those of Speakers A to C, whose alternative he is supposed to be representing. And similar charges were also made by first director of this play, Dexter Lindersey, when he cut out um, the epilogue. I think that was one of the first changes he made um, ahead of the play's Nigerian premiere. Um, a third alternative uh, version of the epilogue's final page turns attention to the true meaning of independence. So interrogating the current so-called independence, Speaker D asks, independence, what is independence? Um, how can you be independent if the very ground on which you walk belongs to people in London, New York and Paris? Independent symbols, new flag, new national anthem, new prime minister, new parliament are presented by Speaker D as empty symbols, empty status symbols, if true power still resides in foreign hands. And a refrain punctuating this version um, repeats like a mantra, we must get the land back. And references to getting back the land recall the platform of the Trinidad Workers and Farmers Party. Um, co-founded by James, I think, at the end of 1965, or in 1965, um, but the, uh, the, the election was in November 1966, um, and which called for redistribution of land and tighter controls over foreign ownership of land and investment. And Shagaramas, which um, Robert Hill mentioned this, this morning, was also a major issue. A confident, optimistic note characterises all three speech versions, ending with the upbeat Sandy Smith resistance anthem. And one constant throughout all the reworkings is the impact of the closing speech on the crowd. So punctuating Speaker D's speech are bursts of euphoric applause, indicating mass support. So, is this representational inscription of Speaker D. Moise as vehicle of such united popular support, wishful thinking on James's part? Certainly, the epilogue does end by inscribing an ideal or an idealised response from large crowds. And this could be read as a rather utopian representation of the ideal mass popular support James would have liked to have been his during his own bruising foray into West Indian politics, particularly the Workers' and Farmers' um, Party's election failure in November 1966. Despite this model of active mass participation set up by the, the epilogue, where popular leader Moise functions as spokesman um, for the masses and for key Johnson Forest <laughs> ideas, um, this short epilogue, um, and one of those key ideas is that there, there should be a revolutionary vanguard, 
This short epilogue revolving around speaker D. Moyes could represent a kind of one-man um, vanguard. So despite inflections of from below approaches, James still retains a preference for exceptionally superlative, larger than life, heroic, revolu revolutionary figures singled out for their extraordinary cap capacities and energy. But even with these shortcomings, however, the alternative version of the epilogue ending does give Speaker D. Moyes a positive proposal, which is clearest when the focus turns to the true meaning of independence. And I should say that ultimately, well, um, before tonight in any case, no version of the epilogue has ever been performed or published. And without it, the entire play ends very differently. And the whole raison d'etre for the epilogue was to be usable for other situations. Um, ever shiftable, ever updatable qualities, which are further stressed when reworked by James, so that the epilogue can itself be reconfigured and extrapolated as the play travels to different times and different places. Indeed, stage directions stipulate that contemporary parallels should always be stressed and that top priority for staging and filming should be making this epilogue completely adaptable to the circumstances and environs of the, of the production. Um, and may be altered as necessary. So these three pages of epilogue in their various states of genesis constitute a hybrid document between play and political pamphlet. There's a lot in the epilogue that reminds me of party politics in the West Indies in particular, or political speech, reconfiguring, reframing the whole play. All the prefaces, appendices, and epilogues that multiply in new editions have always been a crucial function of James's work. So to conclude, I consider what the epilogue form enables James to do, arguing that epilogues, and by extension, other near equivalents, prefaces, appendices, offer advantages to James over other modes of writing. Um, and it's been noted that the appendix um, to the revised edition of the history is, is um, how does David Scott say, a, a kind of economy, a model of economy or something. Economy yeah, and, and in the epilogue, even more so, it's three pages. So this is really compressed right, right down. Um, so compressed here into only three short pages, the epilogue has a strikingly condensed quality within the architecture of the play as a whole. And use of such concise forms enables James to magnify, concentrate, illuminate, reinforce, make more accessible and bring to new context the crucial points of the preceding main play. As mode of expression, the epilogue most resembles that of a direct political speech, pamphlet, um, particularly party politics in the West Indies, or an interview because it consists of clear, understandable messages, an updatable statement for our times. And that's actually the subtitle of um, Facing Reality, I think, Statement for Our Times. And so this is an updatable statement for our changing times, um, summing up and pointing out implications for the future. Reaching its political climax in Speaker D. Moyes's closing speech, the epilogue ending is where there is clearest exposition of political ideas and of how one actually changes, how one actually organises to change society. So containing the most direct call to action of the entire play, the epilogue also most explicitly represents political activities in the present and designed specifically with a view to being opened up through extrapolation and reconfiguration to new times and places, the epilogue's whole raison d'etre was to allow the dramatic text of the Black Jacobins to travel far and wide, as far and wide as possible, presenting a way of radically reframing themes from the play proper through reconfiguration of um, relations between past, presents, and futures. Ironically, though, um, it never travelled anywhere. Um, this epilogue never did permit the Black Jacobins to travel through time and space because it was discarded on first director Dick Dexter Lindrisi's orders long before the play was first performed or appeared in print. 
And endings are key sites of plays. They're the very last thing that an audience sees performed and ultimately takes away with them when leaving the theatre. Um, minus the epilogue, the play is performed and published, ends in a fundamentally different key and another register entirely. So unlike the Declaration of Haitian Independence scene, from which embodiment of revolutionary qualities Moyes is absent, the epilogue actually ends with his rousing, optimistic words looking to the future. And without the epilogue, the play ends instead with Dessalines portrayed in the act of crowning himself Emperor of Haiti and hollowing out new symbols of independence as they are in the very act of being created and violently suppressing ordinary people and their popular revolutionary anthem. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Rachel. Finally, last but not least, we have Raj Chetty, uh, who is just this year, I think, submitting his dissertation uh, at the uh, University of Washington, Seattle, and is now at St. John's University, Queens, New York. His paper today is entitled, Can a Mulata Be a, Jack a Black Jacobin? James, Feminism and the Place of Collaboration. Thanks very much. So uh, my paper, is, as was mentioned, is called Can a Mulata Be a Black Jacobin? It really is an honour. Like, uh, It's a bit uh, intimidating to be amongst such renowned uh, scholars, especially and specifically about the Haitian Revolution and about James himself. So I'll do my best not to be that nervous. In this paper, I want to foreground collaborations in the 1967 play in two distinct but overlapping ways. First, the play itself is a result of collaborative revision, and uh, we just heard a little bit about that from Rachel. Second, within the play, collaboration and co-creation between revolutionary men and women are placed on stage. The role of women in the Haitian Revolution receives minimal attention in James's both versions of the history in 38 and 63, and this is a general characteristic of scholarship on the Haitian Revolution. It's not, it's not James's sole fault. Thus, notwithstanding his convincing point that James makes tragedy more emphatic in his revisions, David Scott misses the tragedy that black and mulatto women have faced both as historical subjects in the Haitian Revolution and early 20th century anti-colonial politics and as the missing subjects in historiographical representations of these revolutionary movements. This gendered exploration of tragedy is addressed neither by James's 1971 lectures, which Robert Hill talked about and Rachel brought up again, on what he would revise in the history. He doesn't address women, nor any of his others, as far as I know, and I haven't gone as deeply into the archive as perhaps I should, any of his other comments on the, the revolution. But I argue the revision he does address in those lectures, the turn to Moise and the subaltern figures or the people from below, is superseded, in my opinion, in the play by an even more radical one, the centrality of a militant mulata Marie Jeanne. So my theoretical approach actually owes a lot to the quote that Robert Hill put up earlier um, on sort of the relational approach to race and empire. Um, and the second half of the quote where he says to make it uh, to neglect the racial factor is a, an error even, sorry, let me do this again because I, I memorized this because it was so good. Uh, to neglect the racial factor in imperialism is an error only less grave than to make it fundamental. And the second half of that is where I think James, we can open up what James does beyond uh, sort of fundamental questions of race. And in my, in my situation, to talk about questions of gender, right? And so he doesn't talk about gender as explicitly. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about perhaps why, uh, but I don't care. Fundamentally, I don't care that he doesn't talk about gender. Um, uh, but the other sort of fundamental uh, sort of theoretical approach comes from Sylvia Winter. Um, she talks about uh, black women within and against questions of black revolution, in particular her important critique of the Caribbean-wide appropriation of the figure uh, Caliban. What is displaced, Winter argues, is, quote, the most significant absence of all, that of Caliban's woman of Caliban's physiognomically complementary mate. One reason the revised play is, is crucial to what I'm talking about is because the play isn't after some black mother or, who is, as wife and mother, reproducing the social order that privileges patriarchy. Um, there's actually something like Caliban's woman in the figure of Marie Jeanne. By tracking the emergence of the women question in terms of James's collaborations, I argue for an alternative approach to studying James on questions of gender. For a couple of decades, studies focusing on James's individual development on the woman question find him at worst a paragon of patriarchy, and at best a man caught between the radical feminist politics of the women in his life 
and the constraints of a male-centered Caribbean revolutionary and anti-colonial tradition. By contrast, I argue that instead of focusing on James the man, we can best understand the place of gender in James' work through collaboration as an analytical category. And in a longer version of this, this talk, uh, this essay, I run through James' scholarship on this woman question from Selwyn Cujo, who was speaking later, on one side, to Hazel Carby, Belinda Edmondson, and most recently, Chris Johnson on the other. And ultimately, I side with none of them, but with Faith Smith and Aaron Kamugisha, who have analyzed James' attitudes and actions regarding women in ways that avoid excoriating him for his failures, while still maintaining critical pressure on how those aspects of James's thought and work that are and were undergirded by patriarchy. I'm sorry, because you asked, I will. <laughs> uh, Selma James would have made it into my paper, and she just didn't because, because she's in the room. Uh, notwithstanding James's personal failings, women become much more crucial to the 1967 play than they are in the 1936 version. In fact, the later play's treatment of revolutionary women, both their participation and the tragedy of their erasure, turns on the degree to which they can collaborate culturally and politically with men. Attention to the 1967 play, and specifically Marie Jean, provides grounds for seeing, enough, I think, for seeing James grappling with questions about women's participation in the Haitian Revolution and in broader anti-racist anti and anti-colonial struggle. This grappling occurred within collaborations that included radical feminist thinkers, again, Selma James is in the room. In other words, what forced the women question onto James's agenda were interactions with women with whom he worked and lived. Thus, even though I'm casting my critical lot with Smith and Kamogisha, their essays still participate in the sort of scholarly practice, and arguably this conference might do it too, that focuses on James the man. If we are to take seriously the idea that James's body of work can point us to new futures, I posit that we abandon, and this is kind of controversial, studies of James in favor of studies of the various groups within which he worked. And some people have done this, so this isn't some sort of totally new approach. Such an a reorientation will avoid having to answer a less fruitful question, what are James's individual attitudes about women, gender, and patriarchy? Instead, we can analyze James's works less as products either of his singular genius or of his misogyny, and more as products of discussion, collaboration, and exchange across his really important life. Two years after his death, Grace Lee Boggs said as much, quote, the CLRI James I worked with would have been politically outraged by the current emphasis on his individual genius and the implicit denial of the important role played by the group and the historical circumstances in the development of his ideas, end quote. In this vein, I am less interested in reclaiming or declaiming James on the woman question, an approach that might tell us more about the politics of remembering James. Whether or not James wanted to acknowledge the significant role collaborations, and most often with women, had on his own intellectual development, that matters less than examining the ways they actually did. So though the 1934 typescript for Toussaint Louverture that awesomely we have now in, in a published form, though it includes three racially diverse women, Toussaint's black wife, the white French woman Pauline Bonaparte, and, uh, Leclerc, and Pauline's mulatta servant, Suzanne, these characters barely register women's participation in the revolution. Suzanne does represent an incipient, brief, but nonetheless important reflection of James's engagement with feminist politics. However, in the 1936 play, there is a clear distance between revolutionary sentiment, female, and revolutionary action, male leaders, male political, uh, male military leaders, and male armies. What is more, female revolutionary agency is coded through a cultural form, song, rather than revolutionary action. Of course, James was attuned to the, to the dialectical interdependency between, uh oh, page missing, revolutionary women. Uh -oh. This is a testament to making sure when you print something, you look for the next page. Uh, the dialectical interdependency between cultural forms like a song and political action, uh, revolution. Uh, Beyond a Boundary is perhaps the most sort of no well-known example of him understanding how sport as a cultural form is related to cultural, uh, revol to revolutionary action. Um, but in that early play, uh, the song clearly becomes uh, the way that women sing to the heroic actions of men. Now I'm ad-libbing a little bit because I'm missing a page. Um, so let me shift to the, the, the second play, 1967. The centrality of the revolutionary women in the 1967 play is especially remarkable considering James at that point had not yet come to terms with his own failings and his own intimate relationships with women. In fact, James appears not to have even recognized the importance of the revolutionary women of color in the play. 
At the invitation of the director, Dexter Lindersay, James wrote a short note for the program for the world premiere at, in Nigeria. Lindersay's handwritten, handwritten comments back to James and revisions back to that original note revealed that James did not see these women as anything more than minor characters, Marie Jeanne in particular functioning merely as a, quote, sexual target. In his comments back to James, Lindersay sort of disagrees and writes, you have written into her character much more than a sexual target. What is striking in this correspondence is the way Lindersay makes a case to James, the writer of the play, for recognizing Marie Jeanne as a much more important character than James's original note indicates. This correspondence between Lindersay and James uh, draws attention to the collaborative conditions necessary for revolutionary women, women to emerge in James's work. Another possibility, one about which I can only speculate, is that other collaborators were instrumental in bringing Marie Jeanne into the play or developing her character. In a letter addressed to William Gorman and Priscilla Allen, political associates of James, this, is, this letter is housed in the James, James archive at, at UWE. James asks for their feedback on the play. Allen is particularly interesting because of her feminist work alongside Selma James and others, and at Indiana University, in addition to being a playwright herself. Allen's feminist work must have affected any direct contribution she may have made to the play's revisions. Or, if she didn't directly contribute, her work and thinking must have influenced James's revisions indirectly in a way that I think Selma James's work also uh, had this influence on James. These collaborations are crucial to understanding how a powerfully revolutionary mulatto character can be so central to the 1967 play in spite of James's expressed regret much later in his life for his quote unquote powerful prejudice against women. James appears to have been particularly inclined to focus on Madame Boulet, the white woman whose slave-owning husband is summarily banished from the play in the opening scene and who carries on a transgressive sexual relationship with Toussaint. Because I'm interested in analyzing the play beyond James, I'm not invested in finding fault with James for elevating Madame Boulet above the mulatta Marie Jeanne and the black Celestine, whom the play depicts as crucial actors in the Haitian Revolution. Instead, I'm interested in the way these two women of color participate in the revolution through political and ritual performance, masquerade and vodou, but whose collaboration with revolutionary men ultimately is betrayed by Dessalines' emergent patriarchal state. Sidestepping the problem of archival facts or evidence of women's deep participation in the revolution, the play breathes life into its female characters by depicting their participation via stage performance. These performances are embodied in the Mulata Marie Jeanne's politically charged masquerade and the black peasant Celestine's participation in voodoo ceremony and dance. Furthermore, both Marie Jeanne's masquerade and Celestine's religious practice are collaborations. Marie Jeanne with black, revolution, black male revolutionary leaders and Celestine with male and female co-participants. In the reign of the paper, I'm going to focus on Marie Jeanne, but in the q and I'm happy to talk about Celestine if you're interested in that. In the history, James alludes very briefly to four specific women, indicating that he did have some archival evidence to substantiate women's participation in the revolution. The creation of Marie Jeanne in the 1967 play, however, conflates the historical Marie Claire, Dessalines' literate mulatta wife who was sympathetic to whites and to a degree checked his violence, and Marie Jeanne, La Martinière, another combatant in the Haitian Revolution, uh, his wife, and she was a fellow combatant at an important uh, battle during the Haitian Revolution. Now, whether this conflation of the Marie Claire and the Marie Jeanne into what becomes Marie Jeanne is intentional or, or born of some kind of error, doesn't matter. The revised play finds in the archive enough traces of women's participation to imagine and center Marie Jeanne. A mulatta slave at the start, Marie Jeanne is depicted as a politically savvy militant throughout the play, whose agency and power are ultimately circumscribed by the power of her husband, the Emperor de Saline. However, the play affords Marie Jeanne significant stage time, consciousness, agency, and activity. She appears in all three acts, and even if always paired with a male, her actions and words make her central to the play and to the revolution. I'm going to skip a part. I talk in the very beginning uh, scenes of the play where Marie Jeanne is sitting uh, with Madame, Bou uh, Madame Boulet. Madame Boulet is playing the piano and singing, uh, and she's singing Don Giovanni's aria about revenge. Uh, and uh, the stage directions uh, indicate what I think is the most important part of Marie Jean there. She's humming something in descant, which I, as a non-music person, didn't know what it meant, but it meant sort of a counter rhythm and a counter harmony. So what appears to be her singing with Madame Boulet is actually her singing against Madame Boulet. And off stage, the sounds of the slaves singing La Marseillaise to their own ends mirrors what Marie Jean is doing to her own ends alongside on the, on the piano bench 
Madame Boulet. And I think it's fascinating. It's this early, very early sense that Madame Marie Jean represents something much more powerful than perhaps what people typically read of her. Um, Marie Jean hums this same aria later in what is again a powerful scene of her uh, sexual agency. Uh, again, to fast forward a little bit in. Act two, scene one, it's in a room. She's with the General Edouville, one of the French, uh, white French uh, uh, leaders. Uh, and uh, she's obviously just had sex with him. She says, oh, you're going to leave me so soon. And he says, oh, I wish circumstances were different. Uh, and she says, well, that means you wish I was white as opposed to being black or mulatta in this case. Uh, and, and so there's a subtlety in the scene where I argue she's putting on the mask, doing a performance of sexual submission, of sexual desire to this French white elite in order to extract, and the play makes this clear, important military strategy by the French against the blacks on the side of the mulattoes and Pétion. Uh, so for me, the importance of Marie Jean in that scene is the way that she uses, and this becomes explicit in the play, her performance of sex, her European literary erudition, she can quote all sorts of literary figures, and uh, her a performance of siding with a Duville as a mulata, she uses all of that to get stuff that then she writes in a letter to Toussaint immediately when he leaves. Then Dessaline comes in, and he's jealous because Dessaline wants some of that action uh, and thinks that a Duville is the wrong kind of person that she should sleep with, uh, and, and she has to explain to him, look, this was a strategic sexual project. I'm in the service of the revolution. And he's all mad, but he gets it eventually because the letter gets read to him. So he's like, oh, and, and it sort of smacks him in the face. Um, so this is part of sort of the, the, the erotic power that she has. Um, the one minute, in two minutes I will finish. Uh, so unmasking herself before Dessaline, uh, Marie Jean re reveals her revolutionary use of erotic power and then links this power to the freedom from racial and gendered forms of slavery that she insists is hers as a free woman. Dessaline says, I want you to be my wife. And, and to this, which I think is the most powerful moment in her scene, she says, General Dessaline, I do not want to be the wife of the governor of a province. I prefer to be what I want to be. You don't own me, General Dessaline. Nobody owns me. Slavery is finished. She links here the slavery under a certain kind of marriage contract with the slavery that was uh, against all blacks uh, on, on Saint-Domingue, but later becomes Haiti. Uh, and I think the power of what she's doing in the play is saying, I will eventually marry you because she does, only on my terms. The terms that imply, uh, quite directly, maybe not even imply, uh, a liberation from the sort of female subservience to male revolutionary leaders that ends up where the play ends. So let me go to the very end just to uh, talk about that. Up, on, up until the very last scene, Marie Jeanne is on stage to stress the importance of women in the revolutionary struggle and to suggest the potential for a radically different end meaning conclusion, to free black women's participation in independent Haiti. The final scene, however, dramatically shifts, foregrounding the tragic end of women's participation in revolutionary struggle, co-opted by male political leaders, in this case, Dessaline. In other words, there's no romanticism. He doesn't say, yeah, women are just going to be free at the beginning of Haiti. He knew they weren't. So after rep representing her erotic power, the play foregrounds a tragedy of representation her power and the broader story of Haitian women's participation in revolutionary activity are erased at the moment of state formation as she is conscripted into Dessaline's post-colonial patriarchal Haitian empire. At the end of the 1967 play, Dessaline has declared himself emperor of Haiti, as Rachel mentioned, and he orders that the ceremonial pomp at that moment of formal independence continue despite news that Toussaint is dead. The closing tableau, and it's I think it's awesome that it's a tableau, it's a frozen moment in the play, suggests that Marie Jean's power as a militant mulatta revolutionary has been circumscribed by the power of her husband emperor. And I'm gonna quote from the end. As the minuet hesitantly begins, Dessaline steps forward and almost forcibly takes the hand of the weeping Marie Jean to continue the dance. Marie Jean and Dessaline freeze in a final tableau as the lights fade. This is a long way from what in earlier scenes depict Marie Jeanne and Dessaline fighting in the trenches side by side. She's got mud splattered boots. She's got sort of a, 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 um, a bodice that she's wearing indicating the way she, that her sexual agency becomes part of the revolution rather than simply a, a sort of a patriarchal norm. Uh, but at the very end, that's gone. 
through the use of the use of force at the end is muted. It says that he almost forcibly takes her hands. The stage directions encourage a performance that would uh, uh, cause audience members to recognize the tragedy that's really happening. Anti-colonial revolutionary overcoming in a context in which women's freedoms are pushed off stage, even while women are pulled into the limelight. So the play depicts the failure of the Haitian state at independence and with Dessalines at its head to live up to the liberatory promise of the Haitian revolution for men and women. The tragic close, however, does not erase Marie Jean's role in the play as a central par participant. What it does point to is that across the play, more broadly, the most powerfully revolutionary moments emerge through men and women's collaborations and alliances. Moui's political alliance with the black masses, Marie Jeanne's military collaborations with Dessalines, and Dessalines' spiritual collaboration with Celestine. And so perhaps it is fitting then that James's own collaborations are what bring women center stage. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, four brilliant papers. and. Uh, we are well into lunch now, I'm afraid, but, um, <laughs> and I'm sure you're all starving. Um, these con conversations will obviously continue this afternoon with the Gibbons and Brewster panel, the first performance since 1936 of the play, which we're looking forward to, and then finally tomorrow, uh, the launch of um, Christian's book, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, edition of the play, which we're also looking forward to very much.